Always. Cool. People are still trickling in, but we can we can get going. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Fitz. I'm one of the founders of Fresh Paint. Uh, today, we'll be covering. Um, we have a webinar today, uh, more than a BA, how to how to build a HIPAA compliant growth stack and, and things to consider um, when when doing that. So uh, just to cover, oops, what's going on here? There we go, Let's skip the slide. Uh, so I'm, my name is Fitz, I'm one of the co-founders of Fresh Paint. We are a HIPAA compliant um, customer data platform. So we basically make it really easy to collect and use customer data across your analytics, marketing, and data tools. Uh, and we have Scotty here, I'll let, let Scotty introduce himself and, and his company. It's a Zoom currently won't let me throw my uh, my video on, but hey guys, uh, I'm Scotty Abramson. I'm the director of growth at Two Chairs. Um, at Two Chairs, we're focused on building a mental health system that enables everyone access to exceptional mental health care. Uh, we've really started in the in the realm of of individual therapy, but are you know looking forward to kind of expanding our services as we continue to grow. Um, and in my role as director of growth, I think a lot about acquiring uh, clients, uh, acquiring clinicians, um, and all of the technology and analytics that helps us do that in kind of a best in class way. And maybe for, for people who are not familiar with two chairs, you wanna give a, a people in the audience a sense of like, um, uh, how big you guys are, the stage of your business, that type of stuff? Yeah, so um, yeah, we're about uh, we're about 75 people in our HQ. Uh, all of our uh, cl like clinicians who work for us are also also full-time employees. So if you add that in, we're about 275. Um, but um, you know, from a, uh, from a stage perspective, uh, about 12 months ago, we raised a series B. So yeah, uh, that, I don't know if that's kind of the, uh, the info that people are looking for. Cool. Yeah, I know when I was looking at people who signed up, we have, um, the audience spans from, from a big, like, you know, billion dollar health, health care, health tech companies all the way to, I think there were some stealth like founders and stuff that signed up. So, um, Cool. So just uh, um, uh, some housekeeping stuff as we're getting started here. Um, I've got on my second screen here, I've got the chat window open as well as the Q&A window. Um, so please try to put your questions if, if you have them along the way in the Q&A uh, part of, of the Zoom webinar thing. Uh, if you do end up putting in the chat, I'll, I'll see them anyways. And I know some people submitted questions ahead of time when they were registering. And so I've got those pulled up as well. And, and we'll have a QA and a at the end uh, to, we'll, we'll try to get through as many of those things as possible uh, with, with Scotty. Uh, the last webinar we did a couple of weeks ago, uh, half of it was, was Q&A. People were super engaged and super interested in it. So please don't feel, don't feel shy um, as we're going along, type in your questions and we can jump back to the slides. Um, and uh, cool. So, uh, you know, this fresh, this, this webinar is hosted by Fresh Paint. So we'll just give you a quick, um, quick overview. So as I mentioned, we're a customer data platform. So uh, what, what is that? Uh, basically on one slide, this is what uh, Fresh Paint's product does. So we collect customer data from your site, your mobile app, your backend systems, things like that. Um, and what I mean by customer data is like who your users are and what behaviors are they performing on the website or in your app. Um, we make it easy to collect that data. We centralize it into one place, and then we're able to send that data out or multiplex it out to, um, uh, right now it's about 200 different tools uh, for uh, product analytics, marketing analytics, data warehousing, um, your CRM, marketing automation, advertising, basically all these categories of tools use the same data, just in different formats. Um, and we make sure that the data gets to mix panel and snowflake and Facebook ads and like your email tool 
under the hood, all in the format that they require. We make it really easy to kind of manage that whole process. Um, and the cool thing about us is we're we're the only HIPAA compliant um, vendor in this space. And so this is an area where we've gone really, really deep. It's a it's a pillar to our business. And uh, we've been able we've been lucky to work with like folks like Scotty um, at Two Chairs and a bunch of other uh, healthcare companies. Um, I'll skip this stuff. So uh, our healthcare specific feature set. So I explained like what Fresh Paint does high level, um, but we have some HIPAA specific functionality to help you manage PHI across your stack. So the first is ID masking, and this is where we can de-identify PHI so that we can uh, send data, uh, send um, identity resolved uh, user profiles basically to tools that are not HIPAA compliant. So if you have an analytics tool that is not HIPAA compliant, or you're just not comfortable with PHI in that analytics tool, uh, you can still get um, um, identity resolved user profiles um, and user-based data in those tools um, while still maintaining HIPAA compliance. Um, the other feature set we have is what we call enforced allow lists, where basically you set ahead of time what, um, event properties or what PHI uh, people, uh, I just got a notification from Zoom. Maybe you guys couldn't see my screen before. Please type in the chat if you can or cannot see my screen. Um, Zoom is maybe doing some weird stuff, um, but basically you, okay, cool. Looks like people can see the screen. Um, uh, you set uh, event properties or user properties, you, you basically set the, uh, metadata that you expect to see, and anything beyond that, we will block automatically to go to non non HIPAA compliant destinations. And so, when we work with customers, this is actually where we see the most uh, violations of HIPAA. The, this is the most common thing. So, let's take the the example here just to um, illustrate this. Let's say you have an event, a, a user completed an action, and they booked an appointment. Well, somebody on your team, like an engineer or a product manager or something, may not think like the fact that somebody booked an appointment is PHI, because in itself it's not. But as metadata of the event, you may have something like the date of the appointment, and that is PHI. And so this is where we see like, it's not the first level, but it's the second level of, of metadata that um, a lot of PHI is contained in. And that's where we see the most, um, the most HIPAA violations. And so um, you can basically pick and choose and, and strip out PHI from, from the metadata of, of things before they, you, you basically send that data to, uh, to non-HIPAA compliant tools. And for the HIPAA compliant tools that you're integrated with, we'll just send that data through, um, that's these green lines here, we'll send that data through automatically because it's safe to go to those places. Um, and that's, that's about it. So that's a quick, that's a quick um, um, uh, overview about Fresh Paint. So Scotty, maybe you want to share your, your screen and, and uh, walk through today's topic. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, one thing I'll plug on the kind of events and event metadata and the, um, and the allow list is what's amazing about it is, is you kind of set it at the event level. And then as you add destinations over time, you don't have to worry about like PHI, like like managing each each individual destination and what's going there. Like you've already said, you've already said like, hey, for this event, I'm comfortable with like these, uh, like th this metadata going to kind of like non HIPAA compliant tools, and it kind of like that carries through as you add destinations over time. So it really makes maintaining your HIPAA compliance easy as you're as you're continuing to add destinations. Um, give me one second and I will work on sharing my screen. And I see that, uh, well, Scott, you're doing that. Uh, I see that a bunch of people have recently joined, so that's good. How does this look for everyone? Can everyone kind of see? Looks, see the great, yep. So yeah, um, I thought I would talk about kind of the two chairs journey to a HIPAA compliant growth stack. And uh, 
you'll probably hear this throughout the presentation, but I mean, not that we knew this when, uh, when I got started, but uh, it kind of requires more than a BAA. So let's, uh, let's jump in. Um, so quick agenda here. I'll talk a little bit about like our like journey to like even deciding that we wanted a CDP, um, kind of the aha moment as we were working through this whole process. Then we'll talk about some vendor considerations. Uh, a quick note on kind of pushing towards the cutting edge, and then uh, and then we'll ask we'll answer any questions that that you all might have. So first, the journey to a CDP, um, and I think a lot of people wind up going to realizing that they need a CDP or want something like a CDP as the number of destinations that they're sending data to start, starts to grow and the number of kind of events and different like different like pieces of code that really mean the same thing start to build and it just becomes like like you're sending like the same information to three different places with three different pieces of code and it all starts to build and become pretty complex and there's like this question of like wait why can't i just kind of have like one consistent like event schema and then send all of that different stuff to the different destinations that i want to and if you have asked yourself that question you've kind of like begun to stumble on to like one of the core use cases of of, of a CDP. So for us at Two Chairs, we were kind of dealing with this. We wanted to be sending data to a bunch of different destinations. And we were, I had had kind of familiarity with, with working with Segment uh, in a previous uh, role and was kind of like, I, what, I, what we need is that, but like something, a version of that that's, that's HIPAA compliant. Now, growth focused companies, you know, they just want to be able to enable destinations. Um, and so they're managing a ton of different things and they want to, you know, be able to turn on a bunch of destinations really easily to kind of increase their visibility, their understanding of their users and their customer journey. And they begin to explore kind of a CDP solution. But for growth focused healthcare companies, it's like a little bit more complicated. Like again, same general core problem, but given the nature of PHI and events, like this layer that you have on your website, on your web app, um, connected to your server, that's kind of helping you send events to different destinations. Like the, there's going to be P, there's going to be a significant amount of PHI in those events. So that third party that you are likely there's going to be a significant amount of PHI in those events. So that third party that you choose to engage with, you're really going to want them. You're going to, want to feel really really good about like the security and the HIPAA compliance of of that vendor that they're willing to sign a BAA and. You know, in this in this process, what's going to happen is you'll probably begin to think about like all the destinations that maybe you already have enabled, but you're not feeling great about the compliance of, or the destinations that you'd like to enable. Um, and you know, that is as you begin to think about those destinations. You know, the, the, we get to kind of this next slide here, which is like, we're gonna explore that a little bit further. And this is when we start to face the reality of what is considered PHI, like device identifiers and serial numbers, like, re, like oh man, internet protocol addresses, like IP addresses, like every tool I know basically connects, like, collects IP addresses. And you're like, okay, cool. So even if we get a CDP that's willing to sign a BAA, we're still going to need to manage all of the data that goes to our various third-party vendors to ensure that we're not sending IP addresses and any other like data that connected to an IP address makes things PHI, which like, you know, depending on what your legal team thinks, like just the fact that somebody booked an appointment could very well be PHI. I mean, just depends on kind of exactly what your business is and um, and, and, you know, and the legal perspective on your side, but, you know, we, we've taken a pretty conservative approach at two chairs as to like what, what, what we think of as PHI and the kind of a, anything that indicates that somebody may be consuming mental health care services attached to a, uh, an identifier, such as an IP address or a device ID, like we would consider that PHI. So. What might what like what this might look like is you know you've got your core website we've got like a landing page provider web app 
all of that kind of CDP sitting on top of that, sending information to a CRM. Great, our CRM actually has a BAA. I mean, if you if you go with Fresh Paint, your CDP will have a BAA. You'll have a BAA with your CDP. But then we're also sending data to like ad platforms and analytics platforms. And not only do we not have a BAA with like certain ad platforms, like they won't even sign one on analytics platforms. Some will, but only at kind of their growth tier. So like hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars plus in, in kind of uh, annual contract cost. So you're kind of in this weird place where you're like, okay, great. Just cause my, my CDP is like covered and I, and I feel good about the data there. Like if I'm then passing that data onto other platforms that aren't, that aren't covered, like I'm still kind of, I'm in violation of HIPAA. And so what now? I mean, here's what your choices are, right? You can stop using destinations that collect things like IP address and like your event data by default. You can sign BAAs with all of those desti destinations that collect these things. Now that's like not like either gonna be really expensive or not possible. You can just be in violation of HIPAA or, and that was kind of, this was kind of the aha moment, um, like you're going to need more than just a BAA. Um, so not only are you going to need a CDP that's willing to sign a BAA, but you're going to need a CDP that's willing to partner with you to build out a feature set that enables your growth stack to be HIPAA compliant or one that has already built that feature set by working with other healthcare companies. Um, and I think like, this is really where like, uh, this, like two chairs in fresh paint came together and like I can say very honestly that when we initially signed our contract, I hadn't realized the full implication of like all the destinations that we wanted to send our data to and like what was going to be necessary to make, um, to like really make sure that our growth stack was like genuinely compliant. Um, you know, I think for a long time, it was like, is IP address really that bad? It was like something we would say internally. Um, and the answer is, is like, you know, you guys all work at healthcare companies, presumably, and you can debate that internally too. But like, we really wanted to like step up and, uh, and, you know, and live by the letter of the, and live by the letter of the law to the extent that we could. And um, Fresh Paint was there for us in terms of thinking about um, the feature set and really uh, working with our kind of very specific use cases and then kind of translating those into, into really awesome and scalable features that have like then come on to like benefit us again as we, you know, rather than having like destination specific um, features that kind of solve a very specific use case, it's been really nice as we've grown the complexity of our stack to have the features that they've built kind of continue to support us. Um, so, you know, ultimately I think, you know, the biggest learning for me as I, as I went down the path of, of trying to build a HIPAA compliant um, growth stack was that like, when we first started, we couldn't really find any, any customer data platforms that were willing to sign a BAA. And, and we kind of like, when we started working with Fresh Paint and realized that, that that they would, we kind of thought that was like the victory. And, you know, the lesson was that was like just the first inning um, and that there was a lot of work to come in order to kind of make, make the whole stack genuinely compliant. So, you know, you guys probably can tell at this point, like I'm, I'm a pretty big fresh paint fan. Um, but, uh, you know, I thought I'd talk through some like vendor considerations um, and things that we work through as a company, uh, hoping that that would be useful for you. Um, the first is don't be afraid to sign BAAs. Uh, while BAAs can take some time to negotiate and generally imply a high, higher annual cost, they're really mission critical for certain types of software. And I think notably like your CDP and your CRM, like if you try and like, A, on a CDP, there's like, you know, unless you basically... You could, the only other thing you could do was like try and essentially make sure that your event data has no PHI in it. And even then, all the tools that work on the back end, that all the destinations are going to need, like it really, really, really is going to be super challenging to, to, to build a compliance stack without, without at least your CDP um, 
with the BAA. And then I think the other one for us was CRM. And I think this one is possible to do without, but really just becomes very cumbersome um, because it's you're, you, you're like, you can't build any of your audiences like and filters within the tool. You have to do it all um, outside of the tool and then bring it in, which is like doable. But if you're like a, trying to move fast, it's just an extra layer of complexity. So, so on these two pieces of infrastructure, we were kind of like very kind of willing to, to sign BAAs. Um, the other thing I'd say is, is, is keep it simple. Um, grow the complexity of your stack over time. When we launched first launch with Fresh Paint, I think we had like literally two destinations turned on. Um, and we've kind of grown that over time as we've kind of gotten more comfortable with the features and, um, and kind of increased our ability to consume, to consume information in a productive way. Um, and I think the other thing is, is like, one of the things we decided to do is like, despite the fact that the, that the feature set in our CRM from an email perspective is like significantly limited versus like an iterable or a braze. Like we just decided that like that would make our ecosystem more, like more similar, more, I mean, more simple. And like that, that would actually help us move faster um, early on. And then like, as we got like a better picture of, of how valuable things like, like, uh, like email and push notifications, how valuable that would be, um, we could kind of move on to, uh, to a more complicated, like, uh, vendor stack. Scotty, is that a wolf in the background? Yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm up in Anchorage, Alaska for anyone who, uh, who, who you know, when, I don't know why anyone would know that, but, um, but yeah, we, we, we have a pet wolf. Um, and then, you know, just thought this would be really tactically interesting for folks. Like what vendors did we look at, uh, from the CRM side, we looked at Salesforce, Freshworks, Bittrex and Lead Squared. Uh, we ended up going with Lead Squared, uh, which is, um, has been, has been a, a, an interesting, but, but productive journey on the product analytics side. We looked at mixed panel and amplitude. We use amplitude. And then for marketing automation, we did a pretty deep dive on both iterable and braze, and then ultimately decided to like kind of go with the automation within, within lead squared for now and kind of think about uh, evolving that choice over time. And then lastly, I thought, you know, quickly talking about like, what does it look like to be on the cutting edge? Um, and I thought I would just plug, you know, HIPAA compliant product analytics with hash common identifiers and, you know, the power of identify. Um, and I guess for those of you who are more well-versed in CDP features, you probably understand this, but essentially it's like when somebody raises their digital hand and says like, Hey, I'm fit. And I've been on some other devices where I've also told you that I'm fit. You can like merge all of that to have this like, like clear, like clear, comprehensive view of the user journey. Um, the challenge there is without device IDs or email addresses passed to the product analytics tool, it can be like really, really hard to actually realize the power of consolidating this event data and this kind of um, across different device IDs. But this is like the cool, like this for me is like the coolest thing that we have going on with Fresh Paint is when you add identify plus ID hashing, we can actually create these like full, complete, really rich um, user slash client journeys um, without needing to send any PHI to the um, to the destination. Um, and it's been it's been really really powerful for us to get to get the complete picture of what our, um, of what our kind of prospective clients, but then also clients are doing, um, but keeping their, their data and their information safe. So that's kind of, uh, that's kind of the, the, the slides for today. And, you know, would love to open things up for, for, uh, for questions. Cool. Thank you, Scotty. So we have um, a couple of questions 
that came through during your presentation. Um, one of them curious as to what CRM2 shares currently is deployed. I think you answered that in the in the presentation. You guys use Lead Squared. Um, anything else you want to add on that, Scotty? Yeah, I'd say that um, we were really hesitant to go with Salesforce, which at the time was kind of the only genuinely HIPAA compliant option outside of Lead Squared. Um, I think at this point, there's a couple more CRMs over the last year that have become HIPAA compliant. So I would not, I would, I would be anxious to um, explore a, a few other options. Uh, like when we were looking at it, I think Freshworks was 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 a couple of quarters out. I don't know exactly where they are now, but I know that one other CRM, which I can I can um, I can look up. Uh, kind of recently reached out to me and kind of uh, mentioned that they were now, you know, HIPAA compliant. So I'd say like working with Lead Squared has been fine, um, but it hasn't been, um, it hasn't been amazing. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that as like the gospel in terms of, you know, what, what choice you should make. Um, cool, thank you. Uh, to confirm, two chairs is B two B to C. An anonymous person asked that. Uh, two chairs is B two C. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Ooh, one for me. Uh, is the key feature that Fresh Paint provides the ability to customize data permissions per vendor? For example, send the BA signatories all the data but limit data to non-BA vendors. Um, that, is, that is one of our capabilities, yes. Um, and that's, uh, that's our healthcare specific functionality. And so um, the part of the presentation here that Scotty talked about where like, Scotty shares and me as one of the founders of Fresh Paint and the rest of our team at Fresh Paints like didn't quite know what we were getting into when we um, engaged in a contract together and like where we ended up. Um, a lot of these features that Fresh Paint has now um, are the result of two chairs. And so we were very fortunate to find a partner uh, in Scotty to basically like open up the book and tell us all, all, of, all of their problems and, and work with us to spend the next few months to solve those problems. And then, uh, and then what happened is turns out that... Um, we end up getting like dozens of other healthcare customers um, on board as well <laughs> shortly after because they all had the same issues. Um, and so, yes, the, the ID masking will de-identify PHI and basically enable you to use analytics vendors, for example, who do not sign BAAs or in the case of, of Amplitude, for example, like um, they will sign a BA, but it's an extremely high minimum contract price. Um, I think it's like it's 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 between fifty and hundred thousand dollars a year just to sign a BAA, even though you may be way below that in terms of like other features you need or or data volume and stuff. Um, let's see. Other questions. Um, your last slide mentioned hashed IDs as the as the anonymous ID to the outside world, but identifiable only internally. Did I get that right? Scott, do you want to take this? Yeah, so that is right. Uh, I think one feature that we have yet to request, uh, and I know Fitz really is is um, is intrigued by, is that it like it's actually identifiable, not even to us right now. Um, like we don't have like a a hashed ID to email address or hashed ID to anonymous ID like convert like. That, that is not a feature currently um, to like, but, you know, I think it's one that, uh, that they are like anxious to build at some point. Um, so, and I can speak, you know, very, very, I can say with, with, uh, with, with certainty that they take like building features that you need very seriously. Um, so uh, it's, I guess the answer is yes, that is the feature, but no, it's actually, it's actually, at this point, it's not identifiable from like a resolution perspective, like resolving that hashed ID back to like, let's say whatever was hashed, that's actually not available to, to like you as a, as a user of Fresh Paint. Yeah, 
Um, I get that right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for deciding our product roadmap for us. Um, <laughs> no, we, we, we are excited to build the, um, you know, basically get, get the hash of the user and, and be able to understand who that is. Um, that's a request we've had from multiple customers. Uh, we've got two questions that are, are very similar in, I think, intent. So I'll read both of them. For growth-focused companies, um, how much should you worry about the contractual agreement with third parties, just like advertising and, and analytics services? Um, they do sign BAAs, but is it expected that companies will agree to some baseline to protect privacy, or should I read between the lines and not expect an industry baseline? And then uh, the second question that seems related to me is, was there a spectrum of quote unquote HIPAA compliance or uh, were you that, that you were looking for vendors or them saying, yes, we are and, and just willing to sign a BA, was that enough? Um, so I have some pretty strong opinions here, but Scotty, do you wanna, as, as, the, as somebody who just lived this over the last like year, year and a half, do you wanna maybe share your thoughts? Sure. Um, do, Fitz, do you mind repeating that first question? Yes. Uh, for growth-focused companies, how much should you worry about the contractual agreement with third parties like analytics and advertising services? So like um, they do sign BAs, but is, ex it is, is it expected that companies will agree to some baseline to protect privacy or should I read between the lines and not expect an industry baseline? Yeah, that one I think is like a very, very like, Pers like personal question for, for each company. Um, I mean, ultimately, like one of the things that we talk about internally is is like not all PHI is created equal. Um, so like the fact that somebody booked a consultation versus like what they're like, what their symptoms are and their presenting concerns are, are like not, not identical from like a risk perspective. Um, so that's something that we think about when we think about like, where are we sending this information and, and how, um, how airtight like the system needs to be. I think risk is, you know, like with all things, like it has to be like risk has to be like, uh, it, it isn't um, binary. Um, that being said, um, I think, you know, where possible you want to be, um, you'd love to be like, you know, you want to be above, like, uh, you want to be, you want to be like in the clear. And I think that the question is what, um, was the next question about kind of like, just cause somebody's willing to sign a BAA, is that, is that like enough? Um, I'd say no, like, it, I think it's a real, it's a good starting point. Um, but I think, you know, part of the vendor selection process is really understanding the vendor through, through your communications with them and understanding whether like, do they even understand what it means to sign a BAA and what that means in terms of like what their obligation is to you in regards to a breach and I think if you start to get to a place where, where you feel like you're, they don't actually understand what their obligations are to you and they're just putting paperwork in front of you, that's a major red flag. Yeah, I have some pretty strong opinions here because over the last year and a half, I've gotten the luxury to see a lot of, uh, you know, by nature of our business at Fresh Paint, we work with a lot of vendors. Um, both our own vendors, but also like we have over 200 different integrations and then start layering in like we have, we have um, like three dozen or so, like 30 or 40 HIPAA compliant healthcare companies as customers. And we work with, like, we see, um, we see how they're moving data and what their stacks look like and what vendors they're using. And so, um, not only do we have to make fresh paint HIPAA compliant ourselves, which means like all of our infrastructure and our vendors that we work with, like we had to go through and with a fine tooth comb. Um, but also I've gotten to see like companies like two chairs and, and how, how their vendors do things. It is not binary. Like, yes, we're, 
we're HIPAA compliant because we'll sign a BAA or no, we're not HIPAA compliant, we will not sign a BAA. It's definitely a spectrum. I have literally seen BAAs that say, uh, we will comply with like the reporting requirements and like, you know, get back to you in, in five days or 30 days or whatever, if there's a breach, but please do not send us PHI. And to me, that's not really like, doesn't really fulfill the obligation. You're basically signing a BAA that says like, uh, we'll follow like the requirements of the law if we need to, but like, please don't send us PHI. To me, that's bullshit because I'm like, you can't really use the service. Like it's a, it's a BA to check the box, not to actually protect like your user's privacy at all. Um, and so like, I think it's really important to, to understand like um, what is your risk as a business? And, and what I've seen is, is startups are a little bit more willing to kind of throw away the book and, and, and just do things in the name of like growth and finding product market fit. Um, I think maybe that was a good strategy like a couple of years ago, but um, now it's actually pretty possible to, you know, there's more vendors that are HIPAA compliant and like actually HIPAA compliant. Um, and there's, there's more like, you know, we've, we've been able to build a solution where you can use non HIPAA compliant uh, vendors in, in still a way that complies with the law. Um, and so like you have more optionality out here, there's been more innovation in the space. And so I think like starting from day one is no longer difficult. And so I think it's, it's probably necessary. Um, so the, the main takeaway there is like, yeah, read, read what you're signing and make sure it like actually does what, what's intended. Um, Scotty, did two chairs think, start thinking about HIPAA compliance off the bat, or was that something that became a priority when um, you became a HIPAA, com a HIPAA covered entity, like taking insurance or working with other payers? I think like, Yes, we start, we thought about it early on too. We were, but like from a, it became a bigger priority, uh, certainly when we, when we started working with payers. Um, and that's when it's really kind of, um, we started taking it a bit more, um, a bit more seriously. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> Uh, some questions about Fresh Paints uh, ID masking functionality uh, from Namish. Uh, what about hackers that reverse engineer ID off of a few fields of EMR data without the name, which you guys hash? Um, and not to overthink it, um, but I've heard about hashing ideas not being enough. Um, so um, a hash is not, a hash is a one way function. So encryption, if we were just to encrypt user IDs, that's not enough because encrypted PHI is still considered PHI. Um, that's what the, that's the guidance HHS has given the world. Um, so encryption is a two-way function, it's reversible. Hashing is a one-way function, it's, it's not reversible. Um, and so uh, I guess if you had some quantum super duper computer, I've read some like research papers that say, you know, you can go through enough um, data crunching and, and you can, reverse some stuff if you have like whatever the, the one supercomputer that IBM has or something like technically that's capable but um, in terms of like generally accepted security practices um, hashing um, complies with the HHS's guidance on on what's considered de-identification of PHI um, and I don't know Scotty do you have anything to add about like how how that interacts with the EMR data without the name Yeah, it's probably worth calling out that like we don't we don't combine our like hash IDs with our EMR data um, in like the destinations that I'm talking about. Like we kind of use most of this like most of the power of our analytics stack today on like the prospective client journey rather than like um, like the post client journey. That being said, I think like this is one of those really good like questions of like, like risk and like, you know, and just getting comfortable like with, with like, you know, with the, as a business and as a lead, like, you know, and legal, the internal legal, like outside legal, like, you know, I guess the alternative is, 
you know, like what all the other question is like, what is your alternative doing it anyway? Or, um, or like, you know, not shipping a really valuable feature. Um, you know, I think that all these things need to be like kind of thought of within that spectrum of like, what is the real risk? What is the real benefit? Um, what is the counsel that we're getting from kind of like genuine experts in, in this field? Um, but, uh, you know, so I think, I guess, multi answer there, which is, I said, I think like, certainly when you start combining it with your like EMR data, I think that that is like, you know, that's when like the orange light certainly goes off and saying like, Hey, we better really, really believe in this. Um, but I think to fits this point, like from an industry perspective, I do think that that hashing is, is kind of considered compliant. Uh, other questions I'm reading through here. So for growth marketers new to the healthcare space, what have been some of the biggest challenges or most overlooked problems that you had to face? Scott, I think this is a layup for you since you just lived it the last like two years or so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think when we first got started, I mean, it was like the lack of vendors, honestly. Um, I think it's like been really, really cool to see the vendor universe kind of like not only grow in terms of um, like number of vendors, but in terms of like feature set within the vendors. Like I think like a really nice byproduct of, of health tech kind of being a, a hot sector is that the, the companies that are serving those businesses are really starting to realize the opportunity of uh, to, to build kind of like unique product differentiation. Um, and that has made what were some of the early challenges, which is like even finding a CDP that would like sign a BAA. That was like, that was like a multi-week thing. Uh, thank you to Henry on my team for finding, for finding fresh paint. Yeah, it's funny. We, we thought that would check the box um, and, and be enough to work with healthcare customers. And then we learned that there's like, you need to send data to places that aren't HIPAA compliant and, and manage it and, and stuff like that. So we ended up building a whole feature set around it, which has been super fun, but um, it was difficult for us to, to achieve HIPAA compliance as well. We, we, um, we, everything that we looked at was like, well, this BI tool has access to this table, but it doesn't, does, it has access to this table, but it doesn't read from this table that has PHI in it. So like, should we switch that out? Should we sign a BA? There are a bunch of things. Um, and the most challenging thing was like, uh, what we originally scoped was, uh, about a third of what the body of work actually ended up being. So it ended up taking us like three X longer. It was like three X more work than we originally intended when we switched to being HIPAA compliant. And we started looking at all our vendors and like just this connected web of, of, of stuff where like you uncover a stone and there's this whole like other world underneath it. Um, and that was, that was difficult to work through. Um, so, I mean, I get it from a vendor point of view, being a vendor, like I get it why vendors say, no, that's either too risky. Um, we don't want to deal with the headaches or it's too difficult for us to do. Um, but from our perspective, we love it. We, we think it's a great market. Um, it's like, you know, healthcare is like what, like 18% of the U S GDP. So it's like literally a fifth of the U S economy that like all of our other competitors are saying, no, we don't want to work with, with, with those companies. Um, and so, uh, it's a space that we're excited to continue to go deep in, um, question from Jamie fish here has fresh paint been audited at all from third party or for certification purposes. Um, yes. So there's no, um, there's no like third party certification for, for HIPAA. Um, there are some companies that are trying to do this similar to like SOC 2, but um, it's, it's basically like uh, if I were to write myself, like uh, <laughs> if I were to give myself a gold star for like employee of the month, it's just like, you know, what some company decided, it's not an actual certification process. Um, but we do look at all of our third-party vendors. And actually, I would say this, there was some questions about like, is our BAAs like binary, yes or no? Is, does that mean HIPAA compliance or is HIPAA like compliance a spectrum? Um, I would actually say that this is part of the spectrum as well, where I've seen some really crappy BAAs that basically say like, 
do not send us PHI. Like that's a BA that I've literally seen from a very popular analytics vendor. Um, I've also seen services that say like, we can accept full PHI and we're fully HIPAA compliant. And then I actually look at like the, the tooling that they use, the infrastructure that they use as their vendors. And they are using vendors that uh, there's no way to not send them PHI. And those vendors are absolutely um, uh, not HIPAA compliant. And so uh, if anybody is using um, not to, not to, you know, crap on any vendors out here, but if anybody's using Typeform in their, in their apps or as part of their like in, patient intake forms or whatever, uh, Typeform will sign a BA with you. They'll tell you they're HIPAA compliant, but they do use vendors that leak, like your, your user's PHI is leaking to their vendors, um, that are not HIPAA compliant. Um, so, uh, something to look into. That's something we see quite often. Uh, let's see. Other questions. Um, how do you recommend starting the dialogue with internal stakeholders like legal that are especially sensitive to HIPAA, but may not be as technologically savvy that it's possible to remain compliant and build the right growth stack? Um, and this question specifically says like using an intermediary like Fresh Paint or um, some other sort of uh, fancy data governance techniques. Scott, do you want to take that? Yeah, I think it always is figuring out like where, what, like what the wedge is, like into like leadership or like what is the carrot? What is the nugget that like, or I should say carrot. Um, what is the carrot that like within your organization, given what its goals are, are is going to be strong enough to get somebody to like question maybe some fundamental assumptions that that they have um so i think for me i just like made like really really strong cases around kind of like conversion rate optimization um and uh and just like a a, a better uh better prospective client experience and um I think the over time it didn't it didn't happen overnight, but over time, like people became more and more amenable to the idea that we would like the business would benefit like from from this like in like in a major way in terms of our ability to grow. Um, and if you're working for some like a startup usually growth is a good is a good place to to kind of lean on in terms of like the why um, to get kind of like leadership's ear, um, but I think it's making that really clear and compelling case and um, talking about um, you know the other one that often works super well is like engineering time saved. Um, so I'd say those are kind of like the uh convert like increased conversion rate and like reduction in engineering hours i think is a uh are, are two good places to start when you're trying to convince leadership to kind of take a look at this i actually didn't think that i had uh anything to share for this question but thinking like hearing you talk through it um we actually like through through working with our customers oftentimes we'll have uh what's considered like a champion at, at a customer um, and it'll be, it'll be like Scotty, who's the head of growth at two chairs. Like he wants to use our software and, and he totally sees the value and it's, it's his job to like work with internal stakeholders to convince them that it's, it's, uh, it's safe to use, it's compliant, it, it fits with their needs. Um, and especially with legal and like, it's our job as a vendor to help Scotty, like make the case internally. And I think the biggest thing that like, if I think of our failures, especially in the beginning as a vendor, like working with our customers and helping them work with their own legal teams is just like very simply and clearly explaining um, how Fresh Paint works, what it does, the security footprint of like data that we would collect versus data that we don't collect. That way nothing is, is left open to interpretation by 
um, by the legal team. And I think that's one area where like we've started to get pretty good at um, because the more clear and concise we can explain things, um, the, the easier it is for somebody like in legal to understand like how this piece of data infrastructure works which, where it's maybe like a not, you know, it's, it's, it's not their world. Um, and so I think like work with your vendors, work with the, the sales engineers, um, not just the account executives, like the salesperson that you're working with, but the sales engineer, that that's like a really good person to lean on if they're involved in the process. And just know that like in healthcare, when you start layering HIPAA compliance and stuff, like the acquisition process for new tools and vendors and stuff is just going to be more complicated than like a regular, a regular software company or some regular tech company or something. Um, let's see here. I think there's maybe a couple more questions that I'm missing. So a question from Ben, are you using the identify call generated ID in your clinical systems like EHR as well, Scotty? No. Okay, easy answer to that one. Uh, let's see. A uh, question from Andrew Rosenthal, have you always seen onshore requirements go along with HIPAA compliance or any way to think about uh, where it could be okay to to have data go offshore and still maintain compliance. Um, Scotty, do you know if Two Chairs has a, a vendor policy here? This I, I this is one of those questions where I have to just say it is out of my out of my my purview of, of knowledge. Yeah, um, having worked with a bunch of healthcare companies, um, I would say most companies like per like it's kind of a requirement for the data to stay in the U S and not go offshore anywhere, just because that's a shortcut to like a lot of stuff kind of falls into place from there. It's like, Oh, if it never leaves the U S if it stays in this infrastructure and we have vetted this infrastructure that you use uh, then like, we don't have any, like, like, like there's less of a footprint for uh, potential issues of, around security or compliance. Um, and so like, that's what we do as, uh, internally, like we don't use any, we don't transmit data offshore anywhere. Um, so, but I've also seen like some of our customers, legal teams do not care. Um, as long as like that infrastructure is set up in the same way and maybe just the data is hosted or moved or something to a data center, not based in the U S. Um, let's see. Uh, last question, and this was a question submitted when somebody registered. How do you know when you need HIPAA compliance for which marketing tools? Scotty, do you have a, a good answer here? I think it's just, all, it just depends on the data that you're sending to the tools. Um, if you're sending, uh, you know, an identifier and any um, health information, you know, you need, you, you, you should, you should take a serious, like, look at being kind of HIPAA compliant. If you're not sending a combination of those two things, um, then you're, then you're probably fine to go with a, um, or, you know, if you, and you're definitely fine kind of without it. Yeah. The first thing that I, I would look at um, guidance I would give is uh, look at what identifying information the marketing tool collects. Um, and I think Scotty said this earlier in, in the overview of like how, like how they went about this and how they're building their stack and stuff. Like almost all of marketing vendors will collect either IP address on web or device ID on mobile. So even if you are not sending like an email address or somebody's name or birth date or whatever, um, and, and a unique identifier will still be collected automatically. And that's like IP address or something. And, and yeah. if you go by you the level of that You can almost assume that the identifier is getting collected by the tool. And then the question is like, is it accompanied by any, any health information? Like yeah. particularly the health information like under HIPAA. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so I think that's probably like a good clarification there, which is like under the assumption that all of these tools collect like identifying information, am I pairing that with any health information? If yes, 
like serious look at HIPAA compliance. If no, um, you know, then, you know, you can feel better about it. Yeah. And the one thing I would add is um, I hear a lot of teams say like, oh, well, IP address is like not, that's not that big of a deal. It's the same. It, there's, there's no like difference. There's no weighted difference given to it. Like if you, <clears throat> if you go read like the legal language of HIPAA, it's given the same weight as an email address or something like that. So like you might not consider it the same, but in reality, what the law says, it's, it's given the same weight as, as an email address. And so um, if you are working at a company and you're cool with, you know, IP addresses flying back and forth and, and that stuff going to vendors that are maybe not HIPAA compliant, um, I would encourage you to, to retake a look at that because it is possible actually to, to, um, to become HIPAA compliant. Um, it's maybe, maybe like five or eight years ago, it was maybe impossible. It was like, oh, IP address, like, that's okay. Maybe we don't talk about it. It's all, it's all good. Um, it is possible these days. So um, yeah, assume that, assume that the unique identifiers are, are going to those vendors and then uh, look at the context in which you're using those vendors. Um, is it just identifiable information? Is it PII or is it PHI? Um, so that's how I would look at it. Uh, we're, we're just at time. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for showing up. Uh, this was fun. We had a ton of attendees stay to, to the very end um, through the Q&A. Uh, super engaged. I think we answered way more questions than I expected. Uh, so it's always fun to see and always fun to do this stuff. Um, we will share the recording as well as the slides for, um, for everybody that showed up and also people that registered. Uh, so don't be afraid that you're going to miss that stuff. Um, and thank you to Scotty for lending us an hour of his time and, and uh, walking us through the stuff that he's uh, quickly become an expert on.